Good evening, everyone. I'm Anna Markland. I'm Head of Innovation and Change here at the RSA. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the great room and to our online live stream for this evening's special event. I'm delighted to introduce our guest speakers, two of the world's leading experts on the economics of well-being. We have Professors Lord Richard Layard and Jan Emmanuel Deneuve with us. Richard Layard is an eminent British economist who thinks society's goal should be the well-being of the people. He is co-founder of Action for Happiness, proudly displaying his badge. Uh, he's also co-founder of the World Happiness Report and of the World Wellbeing Movement. In 2020, Richard was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Economic and Social Research Council for his contribution to social sciences research. And Jan Deneuve is an economist and professor at the University of Oxford, where he directs the Wellbeing Research Centre. His research agenda has led to new insights in the relationship between happiness and income, productivity, economic growth and inequality. Jan was awarded the Vinhoven Award for his contributions to the scientific study of happiness, and he is the author of the World Happiness Report and co-founder of the World Wellbeing Movement. Together, they have written a new work entitled Wellbeing, Science and Policy. I have my copy. And they are using empirical evidence to help us understand what produces a happy society and a happy life. Richard and Jan join us this evening to discuss how we can establish happiness as a desirable and measurable goal of public policy in the UK and globally, and shape better futures for people, place and planet. That obviously strongly resonates with the RSA's vision for a world where everyone can fulfill their potential and contribute to more resilient, rebalanced and regenerative futures. Uh, so, you know, we're very much interested in the innovative approaches, practices and policies required to transform the economy, society and the environment for the better. So I'll be joining our speakers later to take a deeper dive into their thinking and how we can transform decision making based on the outcomes that matter most. But first, we'll hear from Richard and Jan in a joint presentation exploring how we can rethink policymaking to maximise the well-being of individuals now and in the future. We'll then commence the discussion with a short conversation on stage before coming to your questions, including those online. So for those of you um, who are joining us online via the live stream, you can post your questions in the chat and across social media using the hashtag RSA Wellbeing. Uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing all of you and uh, as many questions as we can get through before we finish at 7 p.m. So for now, please join me in welcoming Richard Layard and Jan Emmanuel Deneuve to the stage. Well, hello and thank you all for coming. Very good for our well-being. Uh, let me just plunge straight in uh, with the first uh, page of the book. That's the book. Here's the first page of the book. So, this is a, a, one of uh, 18 lovely cartoons which the great cartoonist David Trigley uh, did for us. I think perhaps I should even say he did it for free because he believes in the cause. Um, so, of course, he's absolutely right. Uh, we absolutely need to build a better world. And by that, we mean a world uh, where people are really enjoying their lives, a, a world of higher well-being. So the way we should judge uh, our progress as a society is by the well-being of the people. And that should be the goal uh, of everything the government does and of all the political parties. Now, this is, of course, hardly a new idea. It was the central idea of the 18th century uh, Anglo-Scottish Enlightenment, it inspired much of the reforms uh, in the 19th century with the philosophy of the founders of the LSE, where I work, uh, and also, of course, of our greatest director, William Beveridge, the founder of the welfare state. Uh, it is probably the greatest idea of modern times, that what matters above everything uh, is the well-being of the people. So I like the way that... Uh, focusing on the policy aspect of this, I like the way that Thomas Jefferson put this. The care of human life and happiness is the only, say it again, the only 
legitimate ob object, meaning objective, of good government. And if you think about it, can you think of any other objective? Why else do we have police on the streets or transfers to the poor or any of the other things that we have? But of course, it's not just the average well-being of the people. Uh, it's particularly the well-being of the people who have the lowest well-being because we really care about the fairness with which happiness is distributed. But with that qualification, I think we should all sign up to the Jefferson Doctrine. So under that view, governments are there to create the conditions in which we can all be happier than we would otherwise, but especially those who would otherwise be in misery or in despair. So who are these people at the bottom end? How can we identify what causes the huge spread of happiness in the world and uh, in any group? So the, the first issue is obviously measurement. Uh, and this is the first main point I want to make. Well-being can be measured. Uh, the majority of people who work on well-being think the best measure is this measure, life satisfaction. Overall, how satisfied are you with your life these days? Not meaning not at all, 10 meaning extremely satisfied. This is a question which the Office of National Statistics um, have been asking as their first question in their well-being survey for the last 11 years. It's a question recommended uh, to its member countries by the OECD. It's asked in every uh, OECD country except, I think, the United States. Um, and it has a lot of merits. Uh, first, it's a very simple question, easy to understand. Incidentally, people answer it very quickly, quicker than many questions in a questionnaire. And it's much better than having lots of questions and then constructing an index and nobody knows what it means. Uh, and some researchers have basically chosen the weights. So this is a very democratic uh, measure of well-being in the sense that each person is judging their own situation. It's not we academics or somebody saying these people are thriving, these people aren't. They are telling us whether they are uh, or not. The question is, of course, whether it has real information content, whether people are answering it in the same way, um, using the same scale. Um, and it's quite clear that there is a lot of information in these answers because they are very well correlated uh, with relevant measures of brain activity, but also they have very good predictive power, these answers. For example, how people answer this question uh, is just about as good at predicting whether they'll be alive in nine years' time uh, as a full medical uh, diagnosis. Uh, such simple things are central uh, to our well-being and they have information content, they predict whether you'll leave your job, whether you'll leave your partner and whether you'll vote uh, back in the existing government. So please accept those measurements and then let's see what they tell us about the human situation. And I think that this graph I'm about to show you is the most profound description of uh, what life is like on Earth for the human race. So that, there it is. You can see this huge spread uh, coming from the Gallup World Poll, published each year in the World Happiness Report, Anna mentioned. Uh, on the 20th of March, look out for it, International Day of Happiness. Um, and it's showing that a fifth are at three or below, and the sixth are at eight or above, just a huge spread. And part of that spread, uh, as you can imagine, is coming from differences between countries. Uh, and a part of it is coming from differences inside countries. Let's start with the between country very quickly because it's so interesting. So you can see the top countries are mainly Nordic, peaceful, egalitarian. The bottom ones are mostly uh, the ones you'd expect torn by civil conflict or repression. But other factors that explain the spread uh, between country averages uh, include, of course, income, but also health, freedom, social support, altruism and trust, all of them variables where 
the Nordic countries uh, do pretty well. In fact, there's a famous wallet dropping experiment that you may have heard of, uh, where wallets are dropped in the street and uh, <coughs> the researchers check how many get returned to their owners. 80% of the wallets dropped in Nordic countries returned, 50% in Britain and USA, 20% in China. But even though there are these big differences between countries, actually the, main, the biggest variation is inside countries, and there is a huge variation inside our own country, 80% of the variation within countries. So what explains the within country variation? That's what we need to know, what's explaining it, particularly if we want to reduce misery um, by identifying what the main causes of misery are. And of course, they are multiple. Uh, so many causes, and uh, I'm an economist, the idea that income uh, is at all a good proxy uh, for explaining uh, the variation of happiness is, of course, completely wrong. Uh, so let me show you the kind of results which we can get from these surveys where we know what a person says about their life satisfaction, then we know all sorts of other things about them, and we use the other things to explain their life satisfaction. Uh, as you can see, the single most important factor is mental health, defined by the simple question, have you ever been diagnosed uh, for an anxiety disorder or depression? Physical health, also important, as the quality of work, and whether you have work at all, family life, and of course, income. But we must keep income uh, in its place. Uh, the same is true if instead of just looking at explaining the overall spread uh, of uh, happiness, we focus on the factors explaining low uh, life satisfaction, i.e. misery, uh, that's shown in these shaded lines. You can see it's the same uh, factors again. Another way of going at this is to ask people, what do you worry about most in life? And you'll see, uh, I mean, it probably applies uh, to us, but it also applies to the population, uh, which on average is a lot poorer than us, um, that the things that matter really are your own health uh, and physical and mental, that of your parents, that of your children, your relationships at work and so on, and debt and income uh, comes sixth uh, in this diagram. Uh, that is absolutely typical, probably not typical of 2023, and I haven't seen the results for that, but this is unusual. Of course, this year, the income is a huge, huge issue, but it's an unusual situation relative to uh, the <coughs> typical uh, years that we live through. And I, I, I think it's really important to persuade our politicians, and I'm a, a Labour politician, if I'm a politician at all, um, to get a better perspective on what are the things that really matter to people. Um, and the same applies to journalists. Um, and of course, these findings that I've just been quoting to you uh, are one of the obvious reasons why um, in some countries, in spite of massive economic growth, uh, happiness has not risen at all. The most obvious one uh, being the United States. Now, I can't go into all the work uh, which shows uh, in, a, in a much more refined way uh, the causes of happiness. Uh, that is spelt out <laughs> in the book, give us another wave. <laughs> um, um, but we think that this knowledge base is now well enough developed for my last proposition, um, which is that policymakers should judge policies by how much they increase well-being per pound uh, spent by the government. And this is uh, what the OECD and the EU have been asking countries to do. I'm delighted that Keir Starmer has said that he's going to require the Treasury uh, to evaluate all policy proposals in terms of their impact on well-being as well as their impact on the GDP. That would be a really massive change of approach. 
It doesn't mean we're abandoning cost-benefit analysis of the traditional kind where you look at benefits in terms of money, but of course you can turn those into well-being by multiplying them by the impact of money on well-being. But by using these direct measures of well-being, we can, of course, cover huge areas of policy which can't be covered by traditional cost-benefit analysis at all. And uh, some traditional cost-benefit analysis has run into absurd situations, you know, where the arts are evaluated by how, how much they affect exports. I mean, it's, it's horrific. Uh, some of the absurdities which have been done to try and widen cost-benefit analysis, we need direct measures of well-being to get at what whole spheres of our national life uh, are about. And these will then imply new priorities, including mental health, child well-being, youth apprenticeship, family conflict, elderly care, uh, the kind of causes which many of us here have been pushing for. So it really is time that we moved to the criterion of well-being to evaluate public policy priorities. Uh, as Jan will explain to you, politicians have every reason to do that because that's what they should do if they want to get re-elected. And I've no doubt, and this book is slewed more towards uh, decision makers uh, than towards personal self-improvement, <coughs> though it includes that. Um, I have no doubt that decision makers, especially governments, will, in the years to come, be using well-being uh, as their uh, objective. And it's more than 200 years since Jefferson and Jeremy Bentham. Um, I'm sure many people who were in this room 200 years ago would have been uh, in total agreement with everything I've said. Uh, so it's just about time that it comes to pass. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you all uh, for being here. Thank you to the RSA for, for, for hosting and welcoming us. Um, it's wonderful, see, wonderful to see the support uh, for this line of work uh, and, and all the great reasoning that, that, that Richard put out there. Um, like Richard, I'm going to share with you four insights and that get detailed much more obviously in the book, but I give you a flavor for the kinds of stuff that we work on and that hopefully excite you about the book more generally and the subject. Um, I'll start with building on what Richard already ended on, which is uh, the link between well-being and voting behavior. And so the piece that I'm referring to here is a wonderful piece of research by our colleague George Ward, which was published in the American Journal of Political Science uh, two years ago now, um, where George trailed through all of the European elections, including the UK one, since about the 1970s and looked at the predictive power of changes in life satisfaction, as measured through the Eurobarometer data, which is the European Commission's data, uh, on life satisfaction, uh, and seeing whether these changes within, uh, uh, within an incumbency governing period were predictive of the incumbent vote share in the next the subsequent election. And what he found is essentially that national life, average life satisfaction of a population is more predictive of the incumbent vote share than the usual other economic um, uh, predictors are. So whether we look at the typical, what pundits would typically refer to uh, in terms of explaining why a government is bad or, or good, such as GDP, inflation, and employment, we find that how people feel in the country uh, and the moves in that are more predictive. Now, if you let that sink in and think some more about it, you'll realize that's actually quite intuitive. Though life satisfaction or subjective well-being is often seen as subjective and potentially problematic as a result, voting itself is the subjective interpretation of the world around us, and that gets sort of expressed through our gut, subjective, uh, on, uh, on, on, on the polls or in the voting booth. And so it's no surprise to some extent that in a way our subjective measures do better than objective indicators when explaining a subjective uh, uh, act. So that's one point, um, but it also goes to say, essentially building on what Richard just said, that um, it's ultimately a better well-being. And politicians who put well-being first and foremost will actually benefit and stand to benefit from it. 
Richard and I often joke about Bill Clinton or an aid to Bill Clinton having said, it's the economy stupid. Well, really, it's our well-being stupid. Um, is what the next, uh, and hopefully Keir Starmer, will propose in the next manifesto. So that's that, but there's more sort of predictive power to these well-being statistics, like life satisfaction, as measured through the Gallup World Poll. And I think it was actually the CEO of Gallup, uh, John Clifton, um, who was the first to sort of pick up on these trends. He looked at the Arab Spring, which is Syria and Egypt, well, now, now about 10 years ago, and he found that well-being metrics were going down in these countries, general population well-being, even, even though, or despite, economic growth, stable, or actually growing quite a bit in these countries. So looking at the face of it, the economics weren't telling you what was brewing below the surface. For the book, we've done something similar, but slightly more recent. We looked at the Hong Kong riots in uh, March, I think, 2019. What you're seeing on the screen behind me is, on the one hand, GDP in Hong Kong over the past decade, or frankly, not even a decade, having grown 50%. So on the face of it, again, an extraordinary economy, doing incredibly well, firing on all cylinders. But look, look behind, or look below the hood, and you'll see that the life satisfaction of the population, and particularly the younger population, was coming down. So in a period of a decade where growth is 50%, the economic point growing, we find that there's a drop of 10% in people's life satisfaction for that younger population, who were obviously the ones that went out on the streets. So it gives you sense for what this captures and what GDP does not capture. And you may or may not be familiar with what uh, Bobby Kennedy once said, um, GDP measures everything except that what makes life worth worthwhile. And it's sort of what we capture here, I think, in these data. All right, if we turn now to the world of work, which is uh, mostly my own line of research, and we look at the most basic element of the importance of work itself for our well-being, it will not come as a surprise that having a job is important. Richard alluded to unemployment as a big cause of, of ill-being, and we find that here very much. So what you're seeing here on the screen is essentially what happens to somebody who was in a job and is now being laid off or made redundant, which is not a particularly nice uh, way to describe the situation. And also helps explain exactly why there's such a negative impact. People feel made redundant. What you're seeing here is that there's almost a whole point drop in well-being, slightly more for men than for women, um, when they are being made redundant. Now, only half of that drop is explained because of the loss of money. The other half is explained of the other things, the non-pecuniary elements that matter in a job, which are one, social identity, two, social ties, three, a routine and a structure that it brings to your week, and also, finally, an element of lifelong learning, which we tend to underestimate, because post-school, our main source of learning is obviously on the job. So we lose these non-pecuniary elements when we lose a job, and that really hurts people's well-being, as you can tell from these numbers. Very few life events have this much impact on people's average life satisfaction. The other thing you should notice is that it is enormously sticky. So once you've been made redundant, it's not like you adapt to the situation. Unlike many other life events to which you do adapt quite a bit, including winning the lottery. Not so to being made redundant. It's something that sticks with you um, and um, it becomes a scarring effect. So we're literally talking about scarring effects in economics or labor economics on this front. This is the importance of work itself. But if we now move to and into the workplace, does there, um, we find that there's also a wonderful case to be made to invest in workplace well-being. So once you're on the job, um, our well-being, our engagement isn't always very high. And yet there's an extraordinary business case being built for why uh, business leaders should care about workplace well-being for the right reasons, but also, for the, uh, uh, also because there's a business case to be made here. And I'll share you one piece that we've literally now uh, published in Management Science, um, and it's taken us quite a while. And we think that we finally nailed the first causal field evidence for the link between how we feel and how performant we are as individuals uh, in the workspace. We, we partnered up with British Telecom, BT, and uh, we measured, or pulsed more appropriately, all of their call center employees at 4 p.m. on Thursday afternoons for like a year or so, 
and we tied that data to how performant they, they were from one week to another in function of how they felt that week. Now, call center employees, well, we all know, are very well monitored, um, and we know exactly how many seconds per call, the customer satisfaction of coming back, the sales by call or by week, uh, their adherence to a schedule, et cetera. So it's obviously a, a gold mine for researchers on this front. And what we find, essentially, is after a lot of work to try and disentangle the dynamic relationship between productivity and how you feel, is that there is a causal effect of about 13% from one point change in how you feel from one week to another. So call center employees made on average about 21 or 22 sales a week, proper sales, and this was raised to about 24 or 25 uh, if they felt better that week. Now importantly, it's not because they do more calls or faster calls, it's because they do better quality work. So what we found was that if you look at the types of calls that were coming in or that they were placing, it wasn't the, the order taking that was driving the effects. In fact, how you felt that we didn't have much impact on order taking. But every, but more complex tasks like selling packages or dealing with a disgruntled customer and retention, there we find, so any task that requires social or emotional intelligence, those kind of tasks, we found that well-being, how you felt, really mattered a great deal. In fact, a lot more than 13%. 13% is the, is the average effect. And some of these more complex tasks, we found much greater effects of how you felt that week. And again, the more you think about it, the more it makes complete sense, because to activate your social and emotional intelligence, you gotta feel pretty good yourself. You're not gonna be able to care about other people if you're in a big mess psychologically yourself. Now, this is at the individual level, but can we aggregate this to the organizational level? So does this individual link between how you feel and your, and your performance, is this also taking place at the organizational level? So I'm really keen to share. We dig a little bit into this in, 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 the, in the relevant chapter in the book, but by now we've actually advanced quite a bit on this research. What I'm showing you now is the link between workplace well-being at, at, some, at over 700 US listed firms and measured workplace well-being in a comparable way and their performance as measured through their financial reports that come out each quarter. So what, um, and this is in no small part thanks to an extraordinary partnership with Indeed.com, the job search platform, who've allowed us to crowdsource millions and millions of people's views on their workplace and how they feel at work. And so what you see is a very strong positive correlation between how um, the, the average workplace well-being, how satisfied people are with their jobs, and how well those companies do. We dig a lot more into the data to try and find predictive power and, and all kinds of ways of disentangling the causality relationship. But one way of doing that that I think is quite interesting is to see whether do places with higher workplace well-being also perform better in the stock market? So is this something that ultimately comes through in the stock market performance, which has, so, so in other words, does it have a predictive power over how companies ultimately fare in the eyes of investors? And so I'm very keen to share with you uh, results that I think are pretty cool. Um, and I'm holding them back for a second. I just want to show you the base of them, uh, the benchmark against which we'll, we'll do this portfolio analysis. And then I'll, and then I'll stop and hand back over uh, to the discussion. What you're seeing here is over two and a half years, which is the years that we've got data, crowdsourced data for, what you're seeing is just the ups and the downs in the stock market. So we all remember very well, I guess, 2021 was a wonderful year if you had any stocks uh, 2022, you preferred not to have invested in because it was the worst, it was a proper bear market. And this year so far has been pretty volatile. So you see the S&P 500, the Nasdaq, and the Dow Jones. I'm about to show you now how you would have done had you invested in the, just based on good workplaces, as reported, as self-reported by people themselves. What you're seeing here is the results of simply listing in our crowdsourced data the 100 best companies to work for according to the people themselves. Um, and then um, use that ranking, which we've compiled on the basis of 2020 data, use that on January 1st, 2021 to set up a portfolio where say for $1,000, you put $10 uh, in, in, in each one of these top 100 companies, and then you go back to bed for a year. You wake up at the end of the year and you would have outperformed all of the main benchmark indices. And on January 1st, 2022, you do the exact same process again um, you look at the best companies to work for according to the employees themselves 
in 2022, and you put the, the money to work in January 2023, and you would have seen it would have um, 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 done pretty well so far as well. All this to say that there's something that markets um, or economists don't quite don't quite fully capture or value the intangibles of how we feel uh, at work. And it's essentially the same story as the one that Richard alluded to earlier, which is that politicians, it's the same thing. Ultimately, it's about how we feel. And there's an enormous amount of predictive power in this that is not fully captured by politicians or business leaders or even investors, it would seem. But it seems to me that the tide is turning. So well-being is, I think, a topic with lots of wind and its sails. And I thank all of you being here and I'm looking forward to the questions you may have. So thank you. Thank you for the mic picture to say the I think your microphone might have dropped. Mm. We'll get that sorted. Um, thank you, gentlemen. I, um, I'm off to buy my stocks tomorrow, <laughs> so that's a handy tip. Thank you. Um, I had a few, uh, a, a few questions, uh, the chair's privilege to, to give to you guys, having read the book, uh, and then I'll open it up to the floor. So I guess my first question, both of you alluded to the fact that the tide is turning, as you just said. Um, so given that well-being isn't a new concept, given that many governments should have been thinking about this before. What gives you hope that now it's going to be different? And where are you seeing signs of governments really acting to adopt well-being at the heart of their policy making? Well, it's rich, isn't it? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a science. Um, I mean, this, this was a, a sort of speculative idea in the 18th century uh, and continued to be so in the 19th and early part of the 20th century. It's only when you get uh, 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 you can actually measure something uh, that you can really uh, make it the target for your policies. So, you know, how GDP got into its uh, illegitimate role <laughs> is because it could be measured. Uh, and you, uh, you can't displace a, a wrong target um, that is measured except with the right target, which is also measured. Mm. So I think it's a fact that you can measure it, and then you, that we, do, we do have some genuine understanding of what its causes are, which correspond, that's why I put up that second graph, to what people say, what do you worry about? Uh, so you've got two completely different ways of getting at what's important to people. One is you ask them how, how they're feeling, and you ask them, or you have information on other aspects of their lives and you explain how they're feeling by the other aspects. That gives one set of priorities. Another, you ask them directly, what are you most worried about? And you find it's the same list, in the same order. Uh, you're beginning to get somewhere towards something which is an operational, you know, a, a, a basis for an, an operational policy. And you mentioned Keir Starmer has made some commitments toward that, but hasn't had a chance to enact it. Are there other governments that have had a chance to test this in, in practice? Do you want to talk about you know, you know, we New got, Zealand? Uh, yes, absolutely. So there's, um, I think the most famous example would have probably been Jacinda Ardern's well-being budget, um, which was enacted oh, a few years ago now, and is part of now become part of the DNA of the New Zealand government. Um, and it builds on the OECD's framework, which is called Better Lives, which is ultimately about well-being, um, but obviously it's more complex than just about, this, about a single item, about how we, how we feel. I think there's other nations, and interestingly, they sort of teamed up under a banner called WeGov, Well-Being Economy Governments. It's an alliance, and really kudos to them uh, for sort of bringing together resources, um, um, to, uh, and a platform for these governments to come together. The key ones were New Zealand, or our apologies, New Zealand, Finland, Scotland, and, um, and uh, Iceland. And up until very recently, or at least when they signed into this, were all women leaders. Probably not a coincidence. <laughs> um, and so that, I think, was an interesting development. That being said, I do think the UK, while there's always much room for improvement, the UK is actually doing pretty good. 
as for, um, from my perspective, which obviously expectations were low generally. But here, what we've got in the UK is one, thanks to the Office for National Statistics, um, uh, enacted by David Cameron, but I think nudged along uh, by, by uh, Gus O'Donnell, we've got, uh, since 2012, measurement, the four ONS items, life satisfaction, worry, happiness, and you find life worthwhile. We call it the ONS4. And they're now being measured as part of the annual population household survey, I mean, on a weekly basis, and we've got amazing data. Mm -hmm. um, so that, as Richard says, is the starting point. Then another really important, I think, development that you may or may not be familiar with, with which is the Green Book, the Treasury's Green Book, where cost-benefit analysis is discussed and, and essentially the policy guide for how policy ought to be done in the UK and is mostly followed. Um, then uh, there is now an official supplement on well-being and how to do something called, um, you know, apply well-being or make decisions based on optimizing well-being adjusted life years or well-bees. Um, which is a development from Qualys, Quality Adjusted Life Years, which is a big deal in the health sector, as you may know. So there's interesting developments. And what I like a lot about the UK example is, is it's sort of bottom up through Whitehall. Sort of it has penetrated the, the civil service and it's part of their machinery, the, their measurements in the Office for National Statistics, the Green Book, et cetera. And it's not just a, a political gimmick and that they talk about and then it goes when the next party comes into power. Now my hope is, with Keir Starmer having made the announcements that Richard already alluded to, that we can tie the bottom up and the top down in the policy circles together. And that'd be amazing, because I do think the academic world on the one hand, but Whitehall, uh, the government services, uh, are ready to enact this. Richard and I spoke at the Treasury around this kind of material. Oh my God, there was super interest and they all found it super exciting and we're quite familiar with it. Mm. If Keir Starmer were to come into power and make true on this promise, Everything is in place, more or less, to actually take all of it to the next level and become, frankly, the best country on the planet in terms of working on this. Brilliant. That sounds great. Um, incredible. So I guess now that we've got all the infrastructure to enact the policy, I'm going to ask a little bit about, you know, stress test, how will the policy deal with a few interesting scenarios? So I found it very interesting in your book that you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals and you look at how well-being can be predicted by performance against the UN SDGs, and you say that all bar two of them have, predictive, have positive predictive power, and the two that don't are climate action and responsible consumption and production. So how can we kind of make progress against moving towards a regenerative future, which is obviously something the RSA cares about, when I guess the problem is maybe loss aversion and, and people kind of fearing that it's actually putting them at a disadvantage. Yeah. Well, there's the ethical issue, isn't there? Is the, I mean, the, 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 the reason for caring about climate change is that we think, from the well-being point of view, that future generations matter as much as present generations. Um, so that's the, that's the common feature between the climate change movement and the well-being movement. Uh, and I think it's, it's very important. So, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's perfectly reasonable, actually, for people, from an ethical point of view, to do something which reduces their own happiness for the benefit of future generations. And that's essentially what this regression is showing that people, people, people are, are, are suffering a bit um, from the anti-climate change measures that we have to take, which have implications for cost of living and so on. Um, but uh, we think it's right from an ethical point of view. Mm -hmm. Uh, May, if I can build on it, so the work that you cite is a, is a paper that Jeffrey Sachs and I published in, in Nature Scientific Reports, and the first thing to note is that is there's a strong correlation between sustainable development, doing generally well on the SDGs, and improving population well-being. In fact, it's really striking. For usually what we find is when you look at well-being and GDP, it's sort of diminishing marginal returns as sort of like an, an evening out in the end. Here what we find is sort of it goes up, as it keeps, it starts increasing at the higher levels of economic development, it looks like the only way to further increase population well-being is through sustainable uh, development. But then when we dig, dug in to the 17 SDGs, while generally there's a very strong positive correlation with SDGs 12 and 13, 
climate action and responsible consumption and production, where there was this negative short-term um, uh, correlation. And it's exactly as Richard says, um, yes, there are sacrifices to be made in our m material slash psychological well-being in the short run to benefit ourselves and our future generations in the longer run. And I think what I, the, the example I always think of is, is, uh, is, is the one that I was thinking of at the time when we started the paper, is the, the yellow vests, the gilets jaunes in France. If you, I'll never forget, it was an interview with uh, somebody who was manifesting with a yellow jacket. And he said, look, I live in the banlieue and then the, and the outskirts and I need my car, it's a diesel car. But in Macron has now, pro-climate, um, has, um, has uh, uh, added up or added more duties on, on diesel cars, which means that in my salary of 1,500 euros a month, I now have 25 euros less, which means I can no longer invite my wife to the cinema this month. And so it becomes really, it becomes real. Um, and it's, it, what, it, what Jeff and I then really pull out of this paper is, it, and for people in the room and anybody listening in, it, it tells that if you want to enact uh, policies that are pro-environmental sustainability, for them to be passable, palatable, successful politically, you want to be mindful of the elements in society that may not immediately benefit from this and try and either compensate or d deal with it in ways that are respectful and helpful. Um, because just doing blanket sort of pro-climate policies like that one then backfire it with the yellow, yellow vests movement, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's these tensions need to be, it, what I'm hoping for, it leads to more complex and more subtle policies that are also more effective politically. Brilliant. Well, um, I guess that sort of leads me to my next question, which is you mentioned very much around we should care about well-being that is fairly distributed. So could you say a little bit more around how do we think about well-being that is fairly distributed is there anything that we need to keep in mind as we think about policy making in that context? Well, I, I would go back to the, the sort of analytical way I was looking at it. Um, and you need to, to identify what are the main factors that are accounting for misery in this country. And, you know, we can do that in a, a quantitative sense. We can say how much of the misery is due to mental ill health that's not associated with poverty, how much of it is due to poverty that's not associated with this, this that, and the other. We, we get them in some sort of perspective. Um, then the issue is, of course, what you can do, having identified what the causes of misery are, um, and you know, you've got a, a finite budget, mm. uh, and you, you obviously have to judge um, the ways in which you try and reduce misery by the amount of misery which is reduced per pound of public expenditure. Uh, so, I mean, obviously top comes mental health because the, uh, I've been involved in this with developing the uh, Improving Access Psychological Therapies Programme. Um, you can show that um, if you <coughs> help people with problems of anxiety and depression, which are so often either causing them to be unable to work or to be absent from work or not on the job when uh, really focused on the job when they're there. You can show that the savings to the government from simply running the programme, uh, a general programme uh, for treating uh, anxiety and depression, will actually save as much money uh, on benefits and, and increased tax receipts um, as it costs to run the program. So it's a sort of, you know, there are no brainer uh, things. Uh, there are things which cost more, obviously. Uh, obviously, we've got lots of problems with the health service now. That's very important. Um, I feel very strongly that the main, main underlying cause of uh, Britain's excessive uh, inequality compared with the continent. Um, is the shocking deal that we offer to people um, after school who don't go to university. And I feel very strongly that, that now that the time has come and that this has really got to be addressed. Um, so uh, that's one. Obviously social care, the care of elderly people, um, loneliness. I mean, all of these things, um, we, what we need to be doing, and we haven't done all the work, <laughs> Um, is looking at actual concrete actions you know, against 
loneliness, um, four skills for the uh, unskilled, and so on. In terms of their impact on the well-being of those people per pound spent, this, this is a complete revolution in the way mm. we're inviting everybody to think, the press, <laughs> the politicians, everybody. Brilliant. A good place to start. Jan, anything to add? And then I'm going to open the floor for questions so everyone get ready mm. and online no, no, as well. No, nothing to add to these wise words. Over to the... To, Brilliant. To, to some, some good questions. Well, thank you for indulging me. And now we're going to turn to um, the people in the room uh, online just to know that we are definitely looking at your questions. So please do keep them coming using the hashtag RSA Wellbeing. But we're going to come and we're going to take like a couple from the room um, just to give the gentleman here uh, a little bit of time to, to reflect. So maybe we'll have one and then two, three. <laughs> Tentative hand. Thank you very much. My name is Sarah. I'm a workplace wellbeing consultant. Um, I wanted to ask that there, has, there is a lot of evidence that um, wellbeing in the workplace improves performance. But I just wanted to, actually, I didn't want to ask about that. I wanted to ask about why here in the UK we address mental ill health, but we don't address the inequalities that caused it just as you were referring to a moment ago. So if someone, for example, lost their job and they were made redundant, we would be addressing the anxiety and depression and the loneliness and the social isolation caused by them losing their job, but we don't address the cause of why they lost, why they lost their job and what were the issues in the workplace for them to cause that. So why is it we always address, we never address the root cause when it comes to issues with well-being? Brilliant. Thank you. We're going to take a couple more and give you guys a chance to reflect. Can, and thank can, you. can you could you repeat? It? Sorry, I'm sorry. Ah, yes, of course. Right. So I think just to check that I've understood, um, we under the model you suggested, we would address the impacts of poor me mental health, um, but we might not address the root causes. So thinking about being made redundant at work, we would then address the the mental scarring of that redundancy, but not as to maybe what were the well-being factors that caused you to be made redundant in the first mm. place. So, a thought around that. Are you sure you want to round up questions? Can we not sort you of... You guys are keen to go, so that's yeah, why yeah. We, can, we can jump straight in. Yeah, no. All right, so I'm, um, and, but we'll, we'll try and be focused so we get um, as much... Um, uh, you're right, but it's a, that's obviously kind of a, a general problem often, is that you know, people, politicians actually treat with down-the-line consequences rather than with the structural causes. There's one major exception to what you said, and which is why it was so applauded. I remember in uh, the COVID era, when people were about to be laid off en masse, then um, at the Treasury was developed the, um, uh, the scheme, that, the furlough scheme. Um, we studied that particular the furlough scheme and different um, varieties of it, 100% pay, 80% pay, or not being the recipient of a furlough scheme. Huge impact on well-being, and it saved a lot of these downstream consequences that would have otherwise had been mopped up with improving psychological therapies or the NHS or what have you. So you're absolutely right. If we uh, build clever policies, we can avoid a lot of the ill-being uh, that results uh, uh, from, from, from poor structural situations to begin with. Um, and the workplace well-being, obviously, um, 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 there's so much more work to be done on that front, but I'm pleased to say that a lot of work is ongoing and there's a lot of promise uh, in terms of both the science behind it and the tools to address it properly. And I think in terms of workplace well-being, we're moving well beyond the phase now from, of wellness and just like plasters or like dealing with consequences. I think there's now realization, not just with the chief human resource officers, but with the chief executives, that they need to care about their people, not just saying it, but actually doing it. And then it requires more than just assigning this to an HR officer. It means structural things, including better pay, uh, uh, no bullying, inclusion, diversity, is generating a sense of belonging in the workplace, all to help people's well-being and feel good at work, because we spend a hell of a lot of time there. Um, if I could say, I mean, I, 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 I spent more of my life working on employment than on well-being. <laughs> so so I'm a strong, strong supporter of um, active labour market policy. Um, but if we want to... Um, prevent low well-being. I mean, the most obvious lever we have is the schools. Um, and uh, it is deeply shocking that the well-being of children is not an explicit goal 
and it could be a measurable goal um, of education. In fact, if it's not measured, uh, the chances that we can somehow weight our education uh, objectives back towards creating balanced personalities as well as people who can pass exams is zero. I mean, the, 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 the movement which is being implemented already in Manchester to measure the well-being of all the children, this is a very, very important movement. And the next thing then, of course, is to have well-evidence-based ways of raising the well-being through uh, the way in which schools are conducted. So there's also <coughs> the uh, general conduct of the school, but in addition to that, there's the actual teaching of life skills. So we've been involved in a, a, a curriculum um, over a four-year period from 11 to, to 15, weekly curriculum, evidence-based, um, to develop all aspects of the per people's ability to handle, handle uh, <coughs> life as it will present itself evaluated, good results. I mean, these sort of things should be rolled out everywhere. And um, I'm, I'm just waiting for the politician who will, will have the courage to say that schools should not be exam factories. They should be people for producing, uh, helping young people to um, develop in, 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 in all aspects of the life that they will lead. And um, it's just about time. I'm going to jump to a question online which maybe bounces off. So, you, I mean, you've spoken about, about health, you've spoken a lot about education. We've got a question from online which is around um, shouldn't any discussion on public well being clearly involve proper, thought through, substantive, and sustainable housing policies? So, any thought on uh, which I'm not sure you do talk a little bit about housing quality in your book, so I don't know any, any reflections there. Well, I'm very, th I'm very thrilled uh, that the, the Labour Party leader has said we have to build on the green belt. Um, uh, I mean, uh, housing policy um, is one of the most discriminatory things mm. in our, our way of life. Huge discrimination in favour of the older generation and those that have against the younger generation and those that have not. It's completely disgraceful. Having said that, um, I, I, I do have to mention the fact that in well-being equations, including a special survey of well-being, of housing and well-being conducted by the Department of Local Government and Housing, it doesn't come through as a very huge factor. The main problem about housing is to do with the cost of housing. So it's a financial problem more than a direct uh, impact of the housing. I know that the baby, the baby died of damp, but uh, uh, there's, there's not evidence that this is a huge factor uh, affecting uh, well-being. But housing finance is a total disgrace. That was an interesting aspect of the book for me, and maybe potentially further questioning <laughs> there. But I will come to questions in the room. I think this lady has been waiting very patiently um, so we'll come to you next. I think there's a microphone just here at the front. And I'll repeat the question. My name is Caroline Needham and uh, I'm a trustee of London Play. The United Nations children have a right to play, but that right is being eroded everywhere. I think there's a very strong correlation between the early years provision in Finland and the happiness of their population. We try i'm proud that my grandson can read at four but actually did he need to read that early would he not have been happier in the finnish system where the emphasis is on play and that play provides children with a rich experience where they learn to relate to others and it, children who have a happy childhood are less likely to grow up to be the bullies in industry that are actually triggering the kinds of problems that we're talking about. We need to look earlier. Early years are vital and the current government sees the answer to have less happiness in nurseries because less staff to look after children I'm going to means push you for a less question. happy environment. Is there a question in that? So the question is, 
how can we change the environment to value those adults who support early years and, and children, I'm saying younger than 11, earlier? Brilliant. Thank you very much. What, what was it? So the question is, how do we support, uh, I guess, policy changes that prioritise happiness and well-being right from early years? Yes. Well, I, I, I don't know anywhere. <laughs> a bit innocent. I mean, we could have petitions and so on, but we just have to argue the case, don't we? I mean, the evidence um, is uh, is so so strong and. The neglect is so obvious. Uh, the thing which I've been involved with, um, the child mental health, I mean, it, it is completely incredible that when we know that um, more than a half of the people who have mental, uh, adult mental health problems already had a problem when, when they were children, most of these problems, like social anxiety, are treated after they've been there for about 20 years. I mean, it's a complete disgrace. Um, the child mental health scene, but also the, the general early years. Um, we just have to argue the case. I, I, I don't know any kind of... Uh, <laughs> we want to glue ourselves to, to, to the roadside. Um, I, I, I don't know quite what, what kind of action you're thinking other than argument. <laughs> yeah. Can I... Maybe one course of action, Richard, is... Um, one thing I've been appalled by, and could, could be one explanation, or part of the explanation why there's so little attention on, on children and young and adolescents, is there's so little data on it. Obviously, I'm wearing my economics empirical hat, but for example, in our very own World Happiness Report, few people know this, but it's really just 18 plus. So we do population well-being, and we give these country rankings with Finland on top and Afghanistan at the bottom. Richard showed it to you, what was it, 40 minutes ago. That's 18 plus only. We don't have uh, uh, proper data for below 18. So I've been insisting with our editorial team that for next year, we'll try and figure out and find ways of data. The OECD PISA data, um, it gives a bit of an insight into how uh, I think 13, 14 year olds feel across about 25 or 35 countries. And what I've seen from that is a very, very, very disturbing, uh, like off the cliff and, and pre-COVID and COVID having exacerbated it. But to give you a sense of just the poor measurement is that PISA, the OECD data, is once every four years. So anyway, so yeah, there's very little data on, 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 on the well-being of, very, of young children on the one hand. And then I think, frankly, a political element, Richard, is they can't vote. They, have, they don't sway. They don't weigh in on policy. You don't count to politicians if you don't, can't vote for them. There's so many hands in the room. I am really sorry. We actually are at time. Um, so I am going to have to wrap up. I'm very sorry to all the people that haven't had your question answered, but I think there may be a chance to maybe ask the gentleman because they will be staying around. So I've got the exciting news to say. Firstly, thank you to everyone who attended in person and those joining us online. I don't know why I'm looking there. They're not there. Um, <laughs> it's been great having you with us. Uh, a big thank you for the questions that we did have time for. Um, those of you in the room now have the chance to purchase a copy of Wellbeing Science and Policy, and Richard and Jan will be pleased to sign your copy and potentially answer your question, if, if you can keep it short and sweet. Uh, for everyone joining online, please click the link in the chat to purchase the book. Uh, and a note, the publication is now also available on open access at cambridge.org slash wellbeing. You'll find links in the chat if you're joining online for more information about the RSA's work, our upcoming events and Design for Life strategy, and how you can get involved in shaping the change we want to see in the world as an RSA fellow. We'll be continuing the conversation from tonight on our digital platform Circle over the coming weeks. So as a fellow, you can let us know your thoughts on making happiness and well-being a central goal of public policy. And obviously, the questions you didn't get a chance to ask, please post them on there, and we'll keep the conversation going. So finally, I just have to say a huge thank you to Richard Laird and Jan Emanuel Denev for what's been a very fascinating and thought-provoking conversation. So a huge thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you.